Good morning. A few announcements that uh, I want to bring to your attention. Uh, the first being uh, the church council meeting is uh, Tuesday of this week at 7 because of the Lenten service. So church council Tuesday, Lenten service on Wednesday, choir thereafter. Um, because of, uh, we have a, a guest speaker today, because of that, we're actually going to be doing communion next Sunday. So no communion today, we'll do it next Sunday, and of course then, obviously, on Monday, Thursday as well. Um, you saw that, uh, the announcement that the Easter service will be at 8.30 a.m., and uh, there will be a breakfast, the youth are serving a breakfast, then 9.30 or immediately following the Easter service. Um, Seems like the youth sign-up sheet uh, that was on the back table has kind of disappeared. I don't know who's serving tonight. Um, if you know what happened to the youth sign-up sheet, there is youth uh, group tonight at 6 o'clock. So if, if you know what happened, uh, why don't you let Jeremy know what happened to the youth sign-up sheet if you know what happened. Um, any other announcements that need to be made at this time? There you go. <laughs> a lot of announcements there in case you missed it. Uh, special thanks to those who helped out with the, with the supper last night. There are some leftovers. Uh, if you want to grab some out of the fridge, it uh, looks like the youth might be getting some of that as well. But uh, uh, thank you, everyone, who participated in the pork feed last night. Thank you, Terry. Good morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. Um, special day, a couple of changes, as Terry mentioned, with regard to our scheduling, but uh, hopefully we can kind of roll with that. And I am excited because um, I've had opportunity just in the past couple of months to get to know this man, and I don't see where you are, Jeff. Here you are. Okay, Jeff Siegel. Um, Jeff is a, uh, a Jewish man who lives in New York City who knows the Lord Jesus and has a ministry, you're gonna hear about it today. And uh, he met with our AFLC ministerial meeting this past week, and, uh, and he's had an opportunity in the past, oh, what, four days to meet with about four different churches in our AFLC and just share and have different Seder meals and different opportunities. And uh, he's, we were fortunate enough to nab him for this, this morning, and I know he has another event up at Living Word tonight in Sioux Falls. Uh, so we've been keeping him busy, but uh, he is a blessing, and there's some exciting opportunities he's going to share, uh, and some of you may kind of lend a, a close ear to that. You may be, have some interest in some of those opportunities. So um, I just wanted to draw your attention to the insert that's in your bulletin, and this is something that uh, we'll remind you again before you leave, but uh, Jeff would very much like for you to fill that out and uh, drop it in. There's a table as you come in. You can't miss it. You're going to bump into it. Um, there's going to be a place just to leave that on the table with your information. And also, um, we are going to just bless him with a love offering. Uh, and that, does it say on here? If you're writing a check for that, it should be made out to Global Baseball. And you'll know why after you hear from Jeff. Uh, but Global Baseball, not Redeemer. And then just leave that with the the tear off from the insert at the table uh, as you go out today. But he'll share more information about that, but uh, just a heads up on that. Um, I think those are the only other announcements. We'll look forward to hearing from you, Jeff, in a few minutes here. But I would like to open our, our worship time this morning with Psalm 100. And it's a short psalm, but let me read it for you. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. 
Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you. We worship you this morning for your goodness and your faithfulness toward us. And Lord, I, I ask now that you would just loosen uh, not only our tongues, but our very spirits as we would offer up to you our worship. For you are worthy. Thank you for being in this very room. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to open by uh, singing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. If you do have a hymnal, it's number four, but the words will be on the screen. And then we're going to move right into just worshiping him, acknowledging him as our king. So, all hail the power. Can we stand? This seems like a song we need to stand to sing. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Thank you.
be seated. Our service this morning, as you probably have noted already, is going to be uh, abbreviated in several ways. Um, I have a, a shorter list of people that we will pray for. I'm, this is going to be a very concise, and I'm just going to lift these names to the Lord and, and let him uh, minister as he would reach into each of their lives rather than taking the normal time we would with it. Um, I'm, we're going to pray for... I got word, I don't think they're here, Iris and Gary Schultz are both quite sick. Uh, I'm going to pray for them and continue to pray for Bev Frisley. Richard, it's great to have you here today. He spent the last, most of the last couple of weeks in the hospital and he says he's feeling great. Uh, and we praise the Lord for that. I'm going to continue praying for Glenn and Kay and Eileen Husman and David Stensland and uh, anybody else whose name needs to be on this list today, Carol. I did not hear that. Marianne Severson passed away on Friday. Okay. Thank you for that. Myrene and then uh, Bet Betty. It's Kurt's birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday, Kurt. Congratulations. Get to do anything you want tomorrow. Okay, Betty. <laughs> Teresa Benson, yes. Any other names? Arnie. Say, th Say that last name again. Sam? Sam Pia? Plucka. Sam Plucka. Okay. Yes, Tyler. Kyle's birthday? Happy birthday, Kyle. Any others? Okay, and as we pray these, I, again, the Lord knows the needs and the details. Um, we're just going to present them before him. So let's, would you bow with me? Father God, thank you for your faithfulness, and thank you, God, that you do know our needs, and you are uh, more than willing to respond when we ask. And even when we don't, God, you are so full of grace. So, Lord, we appeal to your love and your grace and your strength today as we lift up these names, knowing that you will reach into their lives and into their needs. Lift before you Iris and Gary Schultz and Bev Frisley, Glenn and Kay Nelson. Continue to pray for Richard Hill. Praise you, God, for your protection over each of these situations. For Eileen Huseman, David Stensland, Marianne Severson's family in her loss. Pray for Teresa Benson. We lift up Deb Samplica. And Lord, there are other names uh, that you know, things, situations that need not only your presence, but your special touch. And we just ask God, invite you into every situation. Ask your blessing, your strength. Uh, blessing on those who are celebrating. We think of Kurt Hepner and and, uh, and we pray for Kyle in his special day, too, coming up this week. And any others, Lord, whether it's anniversaries or birth dates or special days uh, marking special events, we ask that you would be welcome in every situation and pour blessing down upon it. And, Lord, upon our speaker today, Jeff, thank you for his being here. We ask, God, that you would use what's on his heart today to bless us and that we, in turn, would be a blessing to him and the people that are reached through his ministry. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we're going to take our uh, regular weekly offering at this time. Uh, so we'd ask our ushers to come forward. If you have not filled out a prayer slip and want to be prayed for this week, do we have anybody with prayer slips? Noel's in the back. So raise your hand if you need one. And again, if you're a guest, just uh, write your first and last name. Pick one up as you go out and pray for that person as the Lord leads you each day this week. Thank you.
ago. That helps to turn that on. Uh, I just noticed somebody who's here and hasn't been able to be for a while. Welcome back, Clarence. He's been dealing with recovery of a new knee, so uh, we should have had your name. Lord, pray for, intervene for Clarence, too, and bring that healing and that pain uh, to an end. So good to have you back. Uh, we're going to give the rest of our hour to Jeff Siegel, and I, I shared just a couple of things about him uh, as we began our, our service this morning, and rather than me trying to tell you what I know not as much about, I'm just going to have you welcome him, and he's going to share how God has worked in his life and some opportunities that God has opened up through his life and ministry. So would you welcome Jeff Siegel? Good morning. Boker Tov. I didn't say broken toe. That's um, Hebrew, Boker Tov, for good morning. Can everyone say Boker Tov? Okay, you're all ready to go to Israel. Well, um, I had the privilege um, after playing college baseball to get connected with a company called Service Master. Service Master. Some of you may have heard uh, about this company seeing the yellow trucks drive around. That's, those are like an ownership end in the company. But I worked in contracted management in the healthcare industry. Uh, and my final uh, job with Service Master um, was in, in working on a college campus at Gwinnett Technical College in the greater Atlanta area. So I had a very nice career in a lot of uh, the founder, Marion Wade, uh, who was connected with um, Wheaton College and kind of connected with the Graham family, etc., um, was involved in a flash fire. I, I read his kind of testimonial book. Uh, it was pretty cool to work for a company that had Christian values. God was using that to lay foundations in me. And after a flash fire where it, uh, he was in the hospital and he almost lost his sight, while he was in the hospital, he said, Lord, if you'll heal me, he said, I'm going to give the whole business to you. And then it went from a small uh, kind of like um, hospital cleaning type of company to a great international company where they bought out Mary Maids, True Green, and a lot of other companies at the time. And so I ended up in contracted management, working in healthcare and college, and um, it was a very good opportunity for me. I played baseball in college uh, at University of Illinois, so I feel a little bit uh, like I'm in an extension of the Midwest. So some people, knowing that I live in New York, says, these parts are kind of different for you. Um, you know, all the farms and whatever. But, so I grew up in Chicago, but if you head south to Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, uh, soybeans and wheat, and you drop um, a kernel of corn in that beautiful black soil in the morning, and in the afternoon you have an ear of corn. So um, you know about good black soil and how important that is and rain and all that good stuff. And I had a garden out in the country and um, through a friend who owned a greenhouse, I bought like a pound of Illini super sweet, sweet corn and then honey and cream. And so um, I think this little Jewish kid has a green thumb and uh, I, I love the rural part of my life. And so I grew up in Chicago and that kind of prepared me uh, to move to New York for the last 11 years, which has been a lot of fun. But in the year 2001, after working about 10 years for Service Master, um, I, for a few years I started doing baseball clinics through local pastors and some ex-professional athletes in my area. That kind of started around 1997. I worked for the Doyle School of Baseball since the year 1992. And uh, I was a lead instructor for their academy, and they would do these satellite baseball programs. Uh, this was a professional baseball school, but the thing I liked about the Doyles and the reason I did that, and although I played in college, I didn't necessarily need another baseball fix. But the cool thing about the Doyles was at every one of their baseball schools for kids, on, sat on, on Sunday they did a chapel service, and they did a peer group pressure and drug and alcohol talk session. And it really 
uh, touched my heart that through baseball uh, we can help young people. So um, in 1993 in Danville, Virginia, um, at a place where we were going to do a non-mandatory chapel service on Sunday and like people would go to service like this and then afterwards after lunch they would show up with their uh, kids to this baseball program and right before we did um, the baseball training on Sunday we would do a chapel service. So the lead instructor uh, who is a good friend of mine, Joe Hicks, said, Jeff, I want you to do the chapel service. And I said, okay. And God put a certain message on my heart. And I thought 15 to 30 people would show up. 175 people showed up. Community like yours, very, very special people. A town, obviously, that love their kids. And so all the parents and all the kids showed up. And I gave a message on the storms of life. Remember Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat and when I was done speaking I said Jesus promised that in this life there would be tribulation but he said how would you like to go through tribulation without Jesus in the boat of your heart? I said also if you should die today where would you go? I said God loves you so much that he settled that issue and you can settle it today too. All heads bowed. When I was done praying with them, 40 people gave their life to Jesus. I was blown away. This is a hardcore baseball academy. And it was then that I realized that God could use sports as a platform to share the gospel message. I went to Brian Doyle, leading hitter in the 1978 World Series, one of my best of friends at the academy. I said, Brian, we got a problem. I said, there's not going to be any follow-up. And the people who gave their life to Jesus... Um, Who's going to invite them to church? So Brian said, I agree with you. We've got to do something about this. So I began to pray. And over time, through the scripture, God began to speak to me the Antioch model, remember? Call for Paul and Barnabas. Send them around the world. And at that time, they were birthing churches from nothing. But nowadays, there's a lot of, on the other side, wherever the other side is, there's already pastors in place, missionaries, if you're going somewhere else. So I realized there needed to be sending churches and then receiving churches somewhere else in the world. And if we're involved in evangelism, sharing the message through various platforms, those young people and those families would need to be followed up by being invited to church. So on a very strategic day in my life while working with Service Master, I came home for lunch. I didn't live very far from the college and the Lord spoke to me. He said, when you're done with lunch, I want to talk to you and get on your knees in front of the couch and pay attention. He said, don't you see the writing on the wall, Jeff? I said, Lord, I see the writing. I just don't see the provision. And then he took me to the next storm Bible study. He wasn't in the boat at that time. He was walking on the waters in the middle of the night and Peter, whether he thought he saw a ghost or whatever, you know, Say what you want about this guy. Yeah, he may have been sticking his foot in his mouth constantly, but there was still something very precious about him that the Lord knew if he could bring Peter and the rest of his buddies to the end of themselves, that then he could really use them. But even before the resurrection, a very special moment, in my opinion, in Peter's life, he was sitting at the edge of the boat. He was sensing something. And the Lord said, It is I and in the midst of a dark night and Peter says Lord if it's you command me to get out of the boat now I don't know if you've ever been to Israel when this the the wind starts uh, rustling up but if it's in the middle of the night and you're thinking of getting out of the boat and going water walking you better have a bathing suit and uh, and be full of faith the Lord said come and Peter got out of the boat and he went water walking with Jesus and he did pretty good until some of those waves started kicking up and kicking alongside of him. Can you imagine this graphic? He's walking out there and the waves are hitting him in the chest and everything else. And he's saying to himself, I'm water walking. How is this happening? You know, I'm standing on water, but I'm not sinking. And then I think he took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to sink. But here's the cool thing. He cried out, Lord, save me! Snatched him right up. They both walked back to the boat. You think Peter had a skull on his face? I don't think so. And 
without even saying anything, I think he was thinking to the rest of his buddies, you're not saying anything, you're giving the appearance of wisdom, but you're a bunch of boat potatoes, and I got out of the boat. But here's the cool thing about Peter's obedience, at least that day. A day came, and all of their lives were in their own way. They heard the call to ministry, and they all got out of the boat as well. And I believe all of those apostles, all those disciples, the 120 in the upper room when they received the Holy Spirit, they began to walk on the waters of life for Jesus and to become mighty testimonies for him. Jeff, if you want to see the provision, you're going to have to get out of the boat. And you know, sometimes when we're witnesses for Jesus and we're fishing here, remember after the resurrection, Jesus said to the disciples, hey guys, have you caught any fish? We've been out all night, we haven't caught a thing. He said, cast your net on the right side of the boat. Sometimes you're fishing here, you're catching a lot of fish, but then all of a sudden, your fishing hole dries up. And Jesus says, I have fish that you know not of, but you're going to have to throw the net on the other side of the boat. Brothers and sisters, when Peter went water walking with Jesus, sometimes this, when the Spirit is leading, we have to go where he is which means we have to get out of our comfort zone and by faith begin to walk in a brand new way. Where could that be for any of our lives? Could it be across the street or could it be around the world? And so the Lord knew the questions I had. There were some realistic questions like, Lord, how am I going to do this? What's going to be the catalyst? So the Lord said, you're going to start a 501c3 called Global Baseball. And I'm going to send you all around the world and you're going to connect young people and their families to local churches through the platform of sports. But over the years, over the last 19 years, it's become more than a baseball ministry. It's become a full sports ministry where like Franklin Graham, we bring humanitarian aid with us. We bring doctors, we bring pastors because in the nation of Cuba, we started in the year 2001 with four house churches we have 110 house churches now. And people who come with us who are doing home visitations, so many people were getting saved um, in, in their homes. They were giving their homes, not giving them up, but saying, you can use my home to be a house church. And so we went from four house churches and a handful of kids to 110 house churches, 80 in the greater Havana area, another 30 on the opposite side of Cuba, and we have a ministry center of three houses that we purchased and helped the church remodeled, etc. And brothers like Tom and maybe deacons, elders, etc. are coming with us to Cuba along with congregants. And because so many people are getting saved in their home, but, and they're having church, but they haven't been theologically trained. So we've been doing pastor training. We've been doing home visits. We've been doing vacation Bible school. We've been doing medical. We bring bringing humanitarian aid, light construction, and other things. Well, it's many years later now. And so as I stand before you today, I praise God for what he's done. And I'm inviting this whole church to come with us to Cuba, August 12th through 20. And here's an incredible thing. We have full permission from the American government to do this. And we have full permission from the Cuba government to do this. As a matter of fact, they're so happy in Cuba with what we're doing, showing love to their people and doing these various things. And even the American government, in the midst of them doing this, in the midst of it all, we have favor because we don't get involved in politics. We bring baseball teams and softball teams and we're doing all these different programs. And so the Cuban government has granted us religious visas to plant churches anywhere on the whole island in the nation of Cuba. So uh, if you would like to know more about it, the cost is 1980 from most cities, which includes your religious visa, room, food, transportation, and plane ticket, kind of a one-stop shop. We'd like to bring a second bag of humanitarian aid. We do light construction. Many, many different platforms. So everybody in this church has a gift that can be used in Cuba. Now, when you go to a place where um, you're not going to be using your cell phone a whole lot for seven to eight days. It's all about Jesus. And you lay hands on people and you see miracles happen, people getting healed and things happening that because there is more of a self-sufficiency in America, um, sometimes a bit of faith can be quenched because of the prosperity of America. But when you go over there and you see a people who got hemmed in because of communism, 
And 99.9% .9 of those people, including people in the Communist Party, do not believe in that system. There are more people per capita getting saved in Cuba. There is a revival happening as we speak. I'm telling you, sometimes we think that we're go going over to change the Cuban people, but I promise you, the one who will be changed is you. Even as a Christian, even if you're on fire for the Lord, it's great to go into a context where the language is different. And by the way, we'll have plenty of interpreters to go around. And, and so don't worry about the language. It's a lot of fun. You come back refreshed, changed, and you see a place where God is at work, where we can all get out of the boat in a new way and come back refreshed being so on fire for the Lord that that person who you were a little shy to share your faith with who lives across the street, you won't be shy to um, go and speak to anybody anymore because you will see God work in a new way. A second opportunity, September 17 through 27, we're doing a very nice tour of Israel. We will be three days in Jerusalem. We'll go from Jerusalem all the way to the Red Sea through Masada, Qumran, Dead Sea, uh, and Gedi go uh, two days on the Red Sea uh, in a city called Elat. I am hoping there's an exhibit right outside of Elat called the Tabernacle in the Wilderness, an exact replica. And friends of mine who um, are involved in a Messianic congregation in the city of Elat, uh, one of their members runs that exhibit, and it's at a place called Timna Park. It's just incredible that a country as small as New Jersey has all these different uh, mountainous areas, desert, so many different climates in one country. You've never seen anything like this. And then we're going to spend the last four days uh, on the Sea of Galilee. And by the time uh, when you come home and you read the Bible, um, the words just seem to jump off the pages in a new way because of the places that you walk where Jesus walked, where the prophets walked, the land of the Bible, it's very special. The cost is $3,400, which includes everything, plane ticket, room food, transportation in Israel. And my hope is if we get enough people coming from the Sioux Falls area and the churches that Brother Tom mentioned, that rather than you having to fly with the rest of the group out of New York, perhaps I could uh, recost it at a very similar price to fly you maybe out of uh, St. Paul, Minnesota or Chicago. You can all let me know where it would be best. On another hand, we'll see uh, to make it most cost effective for you to take the least amount of planes and then meet the rest of the group, maybe get there an hour or two before we get in. And then we all meet uh, in the waiting area, hug each other, hop on the bus and go have a great time in Israel. So those are two opportunities um, that are coming up. That's September 17 through 27. Uh, as as uh, Pastor Tom said, this is a brochure about why baseball or why sports. And if you'll, at the time of offering, uh, fill out your name, address, phone number, and email, I'd like to stay in touch with you by sending you a bi-monthly hard copy of our newsletter so you know the progress we're making around the world. And then also, um, modern day, I like using uh, an email. It's called um, Constant Contact. It's like MailChimp. And I can do those more than every other month because... Uh, however many times we want to utilize it to let you know trips are coming up, uh, opportunities per request, this kind of thing. So I have these um, itineraries and brochures of Israel and then Cuba. have plenty in the lobby for those who are interested. And some of the newsletters as well from Israel and Cuba. And the last thing is we are ECFA approved. Many of you have maybe heard of this. For the last um, 19 years, we've been financially vetted uh, by an organization. It's like the good housekeeping seal uh, of Christian funds, and they put you through very stringent um, accountability. And our board of directors said, this is very important that we do this. And so for the last 19 years, we can account for every penny that's gone through the ministry and to show that we have never misused it. My personal kind of model of ministry and finance. I read the book Just As I Am by Billy Graham and I really respect him. He never, um, he took a reasonable salary when he would pull up to the Queen's Palace in England. He would show up with a, with a brand new Ford while other people had their Rolls Royces. Um, 
I don't ever want to um, exceed what would be industry commensurate with salary, these kind of things. And more important, God said to me that day when I said, okay, Lord, yes, Lord, I will walk, I, I will water walk with you. He said to me, Jeff, don't worry about how you're going to be taken care of. He said, if you take care of my business, I'll take care of yours. What is God's business? Human beings. And he said, I'm going to send you through the sports platform and other sub-platforms underneath it. And you're going to share the gospel and you're going to have the help of churches, not only in prayer in a financial way, but they're going to go with you. And I think what can be more pleasurable than to not be a, a kind of one-man ministry, but we can minister together and there's gifts and talent sitting right here in this church that are much stronger than mine. So I think that we're much better together than apart to go into the Great Commission to see people saved and discipled, and that excites me. Well, in, in the year uh, 1975, um, the University of Illinois baseball team, it was our spring training. And on the very first game, I was called in relief at the end of the game. We were leading... And even in those days, I guess I got the save. And one of my best friends who was my roommate, he also played on the football team, he said Billy Graham was speaking that night on the University of New Mexico campus, would I go with him? And I thought to myself, Jewish kids from Chicago don't do this kind of thing. That's for Gentiles. And I said, Doug, I'll take a rain check. You tell me what Mr. Graham has to say. And hey, it was the John Travolta era. I had my silk shirt with my Italian buddies and my Greek buddies. We went disco dancing the night away, had a couple cold ones, came back to the room at the end of the night, and my roommate Doug also came home and he said, Siegs, you missed it tonight. I said, Doug, what did I miss? He said, I got saved. I said, what did you get saved from? He said, I became a Christian. I said, now I'm totally confused. You've been going to the church building all these years while we were on campus. And how does a Christian become a Christian? He said, Mr. Graham made me realize just because a mouse is in a cookie jar doesn't make him a cookie. He said, just because I went to the church building didn't make me a Christian. He said, Mr. Graham explained that I needed to be born again and have Jesus inside of my heart. And he gave me that opportunity to invite Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Well, he totally blew my mind and I went to bed. Well, there was a move of the Holy Spirit on our campus through the fellowship of Christian athletes. Have you ever heard of this group? I think they're also in high schools and it's a very effective ministry all around the country. So he told me my junior year that a famous Christian lady was going to speak uh, at the campus huddle on a Thursday night. He said, Siegs, would you come to hear this lady speak? And I'm thinking to myself again, this is Thursday night. It's pre-weekend, nickel hot dogs. This is for Gentiles. It's not for me. And, well, at the end of the evening, he was faithful. He came back. He was also in our Jewish fraternity house, a Gentile. We really liked him. He was a pretty cool guy. So we kind of grafted him in. And here was this Gentile who just got saved living in a Jewish fraternity house. You think that's the sovereignty of God? So he said, Siegs, you really missed it tonight. He said, a lady named Corey Ten Boom spoke at our huddle. And I go, tell me about this lady. He said she was Dutch from a family of clockmakers, but they were hiding Jewish people in the walls of their home, and they got caught, and all of the family died except Corey. She got out through a miracle. She's probably gone around the world seven times speaking about her faith in Jesus and her love for the Jewish people. And I thought, love for the Jewish people? This is a different kind of a Christian. Whatever the real deal is, this must be it. And then all of a sudden after this, a bunch of... Uh, guys and ladies on various teams at University of Illinois were getting saved. And as I was walking across the street from my Jewish fraternity house, I was recognizing all my buddies and my lady friends who were on teams, and they would cross the street and put the hug on me and go, We love you, man! You're one of God's chosen people! And I thought, what the heck are they smoking? They're all happy and full of joy, and they love me because I'm Jewish. What's wrong with this picture or what's right with this picture? Whatever they're smoking, I want some. This was getting my attention. And then my friend Doug, who played on the football team, said to me one day, hey, uh, you're looking a little skinny. 
in those days. He played for a revenue sport. I was non-revenue. I was always hungry, Pastor, in those days. Now I can't get away with that kind of thing. But he said, how would you like to go with me to training table? I said, sure, Doug, I'll go with you. So over training table, he said, Jeff, I'm curious. He said, do you believe in the Ten Commandments? And what was really cool about our friendship, everything was just coming natural. He's now a Christian, and he actually wants to learn some stuff from me and unconsciously he was witnessing to me without even realizing he was witnessing to me. He says, you believe in the Ten Commandments? I said, yes, I do. He said, how are you doing with them? I said, not so good. He said, I'm curious, what do Jewish people do to have their sins forgiven? And I said, well, there's a day, part of the fall festivals, called Yom Kippur. And on that day, the high priest within Israel would need to do an atoning sacrifice for him and his family and also the Jewish people. And I came under conviction because I said to myself, whoa, there is not the condition for forgiveness as God put it in the scripture. And he never changed um, his requirement. Therefore, I, I was thinking to myself, and I explained to him, you know, in the temple once a year, the high priest would make this atoning sacrifice. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, it ain't, it ain't happening anymore. And he could, it was as though he could hear my thinking. He said, Jeff, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He said, Jeff, I've been grafted in to your covenants by faith through the Lamb of God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, the promised Jewish Messiah, and for all human beings. Who does this guy think he is? He's got a lot of chutzpah to tell me about my Messiah. And he was, did it in such a kind way, I was getting jealous without even realizing I was jealous. And then... My senior year, I'm getting ready to pitch against Michigan State. I was 4-0. I was having a pretty good year. And then my Jewish roommate, who also uh, was getting witnessed to by Fellowship of Christian Athletes, my best friend, Neil Siegel, I knew him since I was nine years old. We were bar mitzvahed within a half a year of each other. You know what a bar mitzvah is? Have you ever heard of this term? It's like the confirmation that Jesus had when he was 13 years old. I had this too. Neil had this. He's a half a year older than me. Right before I'm getting ready to pitch against Michigan State, Neil comes home from a run and he says, and his last name was Siegel too. And so we used to call each other Siegs is our nicknames. So he says, hey Siegs, I need to tell you something. He said, after a careful examination of the Hebrew scriptures, I've come to the conclusion that the Messiah has already been here. I said, but Neil, were you baptized? He said, yes. I said, are you out of your mind? What have you done? You're not Jewish anymore. He said, easy, Siegs. He said, I never stop being Jewish. I said, Neil, you believe in three gods now. He goes, no, the Trinity's one God. I said, Neil, you're one of the smartest guys I know. You're almost a full straight-A student. I said, this is fuzzy math. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, I'm counting three gods. He goes, no, three equals one. He said, if you read the Hebrew scriptures for yourself, I believe you'll come to the same conclusion as me. So the time came that I got away from my Jewish friends and I got away from my Christian friends and I borrowed my brother's, my baby brother Bruce, his Tanakh that he got as a present um, from our Orthodox um, neighbor. We lived in a six flat and if you go through the alley, there was my um, synagogue where I was bar mitzvahed, etc. So I borrowed his, his full Old Testament and prophets. It's called the Tanakh. Um, because I wasn't ready to read your Bible because I thought Christians might have rigged their Bible. I held it up to heaven. I went into my room at University of Illinois my first year as a grad student and I now was the uh, junior varsity coach for University of Illinois and assistant baseball coach to Lee Eilbrock. And I took this Bible, I shut the door, and I said, God, can I have a burning bush experience like Moses? Because to the best understanding, I'm from the tribe of Levi, so he was one of my heroes. Ah, this guy had a burning bush experience. And at that bush, God told him his purpose in life. And I wanted to know, you know, I came to some questions like all human beings do. Why was I created? Is there some purpose for me? If I'm going to do something like be a doctor, a lawyer, used car salesman, whatever, if I don't know what plan God has for me, I'm just doing something that somebody already did. You know what I mean? In other words, 
If I was created in God's image, did He create me for something unique? And I said to myself, is Jesus not only the promised Jewish Messiah, but is He my burning bush? And I thought to myself, in the Bible, where do I get started? So I thought to myself, well, I'll start on the first page. But what was unique about this Bible is half of the page was in English and half of the page was in Hebrew. So I started on the very first sentence. Bereshis bara Elohim is Hebrew. The English is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bereshis bara Elohim. Im at the end of any word could make that word plural. In the beginning, God plural. Well, I'm not going to make a doctrine out of one sentence, right? But I thought, this is a little strange. And then I got down to verse 26. It says, let us create man in our image. Wow, that's strange. And see, all these years when I was in Hebrew school, I never questioned this, never thought about it. And all of a sudden I'm reading and I, I say to myself, well, wait a minute, if it's one God, why doesn't it say, let me create man in my image? Why does it say, let us, plural, create man in our image, plural? Now, the Bible never says that God created angels in his image, only man. So who's up there with you creating like man, but also God, I said, God, who's up there with you? What's this plural stuff? Genesis 18, three men came to Abraham when he was sitting in his tent outside of Hebron in a kind of very hot day in front of his tent, and three men came, and one of the names of the men was Adonai, Adonai Elohim. I go, oh my gosh, one of the men who's there is God in a physical body. And the Bible says that Abraham said to one of his servants, get a kid from the flock. And they ate cheese and they ate either lamb or goat or a young cow, whatever it was that they ate. This wasn't McDonald's. This was a pretty long meal. It took time to not only get a kid, and I don't know how long it would take to dress out, but they were sitting there a whole long time. And one of my theological issues, or what we would call Jewish objections, was could God inhabit a physical body? Understand the mentality of Jewish people. God is God Almighty, created the heavens and the earth, the planets, and everything beyond that. And if God is so big, then how could he be so little by inhabiting a physical body? And how... How do the heavens and the earth get run when he's limiting himself to this body? Well, now think about it after what I read is beyond the shadow of a doubt, God is in a physical body having lunch with Abraham. That's just a fact. And I go, oh my gosh, God can inhabit a physical body if he wants. He can be as big as he wants. He could be as little as he wants. Who am I to tell God how to do his business? And you see, the Messiah, the promised Jewish and Gentile Messiah, would have to have credentials. And then I began, as I continued to proceed, to see that he would die of a crucifixion. What tribe he would be from. And then I got to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, 31 through 34. This was very key. It says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord when I will enact a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Remember, the one became broken for a period of time. Not like the covenant which they broke when I took them as a husband by the hand from Egypt, but a day will come when I will uh, impart my laws into their hearts and minds, and a day will come that they shall no longer say, Know the Lord. But they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. So point number one, I go, oh my gosh, there's something to what Neil is saying here. This new covenant, this new testament, it's for the Jewish people. It says for Israel and Judah. And it says that, so who broke the covenant out of Egypt? The Jewish people. But God is showing mercy to the Jewish people. He's saying, I'm going to put my laws in their hearts and minds. In other words, it's not going to be, what, 613 or 614 uh, laws that we're going to constantly have to keep outside by rote. 
But God says, I'm going to take these laws and I'm going to put it inside of your heart. When did that come? On the day of Pentecost. God came inside and he wrote his law in the hearts and mind of Jewish people who accepted Jesus and then Jesus made a promise. Go and wait until you receive power from on high. And then the law came inside. And then the last thing is I know that many Jewish people did come to know the Lord, but not the whole nation. When Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I'd long to gather you as a mother hen would her sheep, but you wouldn't have it. You're not going to see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, it says, and they, and this is part of the fall festivals, I'm giving you a little sneak preview. It says, and they will look upon him whom they pierced. Who did, who, so, and they, who are they, the Jewish people, will look upon him, who's him? Jesus, whom they pierced. Not only did the Jewish pierce him, but we all pierced him, because he died for our sins, right? Okay, but, there, but we know the Lord. So, although we pierced him, we're forgiven. And it says the days coming in history, not only will they look upon him, but he will be returning because the Jewish people are crying out. And it says, and they shall all know him from the least to the greatest. Isn't this an amazing promise, the God of the second chance, third chance, fourth chance, that God is not going to leave Israel behind, but the remnant of Israel. As you all know, and it ties in a little bit to my tour of Israel, is did you know when Israel became a nation again in 48, about 600,000 Jews came back. About 12 people, 12 of them believed in Jesus. Don't hold me to exact numbers. As we speak now, there's about 25,000 Jewish believers in Israel, Messianic congregations springing up not only there, but all over the world. And there's about 7 million Jews in Israel as we speak. Because the Bible says that when this Jeremiah time frame happens, that they shall all know me. It's a time still down the road when a lot of pressure comes upon Israel and one third of them physically survive and cry out to the Lord and the whole nation of Israel gets saved. And I believe that we have a little stake in this because as we understand how to engage Jewish people with the gospel and lay the seeds, you see my friend Doug was being faithful to share in such a way that I said, there's something to what he's saying. And here's a Gentile telling me about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isn't that pretty incredible? And then I come to Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, and it talks about a servant who would die as a sin offering for them and for all. It says it at least seven or eight times. You can go, and after I share this, go and search the scriptures and, and maybe read it a little bit more in depth. And so I lived in a six flat in Chicago, right across two blocks from Lake Michigan. And right below us lived the cantor, kind of like um, a worship leader of our synagogue, but he was also theologically trained like a rabbi. So I took my Bible, I snuck downstairs and I said, Cantor Silverstein, I need to talk to you. Could we talk in private? He said, sure. I said, could you tell me uh, who the suffering servant is in Isaiah 53? I was acting like the Ethiopian eunuch but I hadn't even read about the guy yet, right? And he goes, oh, the suffering servant, that's the nation of Israel. Holocaust mentality, right? But if you think about it, if you just take a step back, remember when my friend asked me what do Jewish people do to have their sins forgiven? Well, and we talked about the Passover Seder for those who came the other night. The lamb and the sacrifice uh, the Day of Atonement sacrifice, it has to be without spot or blemish. It has to be perfect. So if this is talking about one who would die is a sin sacrifice, could the Jewish people be that sacrifice if they died for them and all? If he died for them, that means he died for the Jewish people. How could the Jewish people die for themselves? They're disqualified because they're not perfect. Never a Gentile that was perfect. We're all disqualified. So I had to break it down. I said, who's perfect? Well, God's perfect. But here's a key. For God to be a sin sacrifice, he would have to be able to inhabit a physical body, right? And have blood. I go, oh my gosh. I wasn't looking for it to be Jesus. I, you know, there were historical issues. There were cultural issues. And I know that you all understand, so I don't need to get into all that. I go, oh my gosh. I said, I am having my burning bush experience. 
I fell on my knees in front of my bed. And I said, dear Jesus, please come into my heart. I'm a sinner. I said, I don't exactly know how to do the born again thing. I've never been to church. I said, please come into my heart. I'm a sinner. And I said, and when I tell my dad what I've just done, uh, and I need to go and be baptized through my friends, when I tell my dad I'm in big trouble, so please give me your Holy Spirit. Because, and I said, Lord, you know how imperfect I am, and if ever I really screw up uh, like David or whatever that means, please forgive me. Please don't take your spirit from me. I says, you're going to be everything in my life because I know what's coming. I know I'm going to get kicked out of my family. So my friend Neil and my friends, I said, Neil, I've given my life to Jesus. Come with all of our friends. FCA, I need a big hug and I need to be baptized. They did. Week after, I called my dad. Dad, after a perf uh, careful examination of the Hebrew Scriptures, I've come to the conclusion that the promised Jewish Messiah has already been here. He said, but were you baptized? I said, yes, I, I was. Now, you have to understand historically what that would mean to a father who, whose father, my grandpa Jack from Romania, he was in a pogrom, and people who claimed to be Christians in those parts of the world, those times, persecuted Jewish people. But I saw a different kind of a Christian, the real Christian, the real born again. But were you baptized, Jeff? Yes, I was, Dad. He says, son, you're a traitor to your people. You're worse than Adolf Hitler. Don't ever come home ever again. I don't ever want to see you. He said, I, you're not Jewish anymore. Brothers and sisters, this went on for 26 years. And I had to just continue when I could, not under the law, if I could go home to celebrate the Jewish holidays with them um, so that uh, I could reach them at their level and that they could see that I didn't stop being Jewish. Can you be Jewish and be a Christian? Yes, you can. It should be a very uh, Jewish thing to believe in Jesus now that I really think about it. And then my brother Bruce started sneaking to church with his Christian wife, um, Willow Creek. You've heard of this church in Chicago, pretty big church. And then I found out this was happening. And my brother said to me, how did this happen for you? I shared with him. Three days later, at the edge of his bed, he grabbed his wife's hand and he gave his life to Jesus. And then a month later, he was baptized. I came back from my first mission trip to Cuba. I said, Bruce, how are you doing? He said, I have peace in my life. God's healing my life. I've never been so happy in my marriage and my children. And he said, could you do me a favor? I said, what is that? He said, would you tell dad the decision I made? <laughs> now, my dad had softened toward me, but I don't know that he softened that much. I go, wow, I get to get kicked out of my family two times by the same guy. This is pretty cool. So I said, okay, Bruce, I'll do that for you. So I called my dad. And my dad said, you know, your brother's made a good decision. And I'm thinking, uh, did my dad flip his mind or something? What's going on here? Or am I, am I really alive and is this a dream? He said, would you forgive me for what I did to you years ago? He said, I thought you stopped being Jewish, but today I realize you're more Jewish than me. He said, is there anywhere in the Bible that Jesus ever said that he was the Jewish Messiah? I said, oh, yeah, Dad. He was before his disciples, and he said to them, who do you say that I am? And Peter, maybe speaking for the whole group, said, you are the Mashiach, you are the Messiah, you are the promised Son of God. And Jesus said back to him and to them, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And with other scriptures I shared and answered my dad's question, and then I received the shock of my life. My dad broke down and cried, and in the Hebrew language, he said, He nanny God, he nanny, here I am, here I am. What would you have me to do? And he said, Jeff, somebody's been calling to me all these years, and today I realize who it is. He said, would you pray with me like you pray for the kids all around the world? I said, Dad, do you want to give your life to Jesus? He said, yes. And I prayed with my dad. He gave his life to Jesus. And my dad walked on fire with the Lord for two and a half years. He had tendency toward being a pretty harsh, unreasonable guy, and I saw God totally transform him. And then one year after he got saved, my friend Neil invited us to his um, home in Wisconsin, and it was a lake house, and after we had a men's Bible study, and we were going to go out pontoon boating and jet skiing, 
my dad said to all of us, hey, stop. Hey, stop. You're forgetting something. I said, Dad, what are we forgetting? He said, I need to be baptized. And when he came out of that water, Neil and I baptized him and all the men. I go, this is like living in a dream. On one hand, when my dad kicked me out of the family, that was one dream. And now, as negative as that seemed, it was all okay. It was all worth it. See, God is on a different timetable than we are. So I was away from my family, but I, I was about God's business. And because I was about God's business, a day came when that which was important to me and even more important to God, my dad's soul was even more important to God than it was me. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to conclude with this. Corey Ten Boom, have you seen the movie The Hiding Place? At the end, she comes on and I, I swear, she looks like an angel. And she said, there is no pit so deep that Jesus Christ isn't deeper still. No matter what is going on in our life that might seem impossible, there is no too, nothing too big for the Lord. Thank you and God bless you. Thanks for the privilege to be with you today. Share my story a little bit about the ministry. Thanks for having me. For being here and for sharing with us. Do you think uh, we could stand to learn a thing or two from his teaching? That means you should probably all sign up for that Israel trip, huh? Uh, and it actually, other trips I've looked at, and for what this entails, it looks like a pretty good price. So thank you for that, and we'll, we'll see. Imagine that. We serve a Savior who's Jewish. You know, there are actually Christians who don't know that. Um, but thank you for sharing how he's moved in your life. Um, we're going to close with one song, and I've got to say, Jeff, I chose this song for you because we don't have many Jewish songs in our hymnal. This one kind of is, uh, based on uh, Old Testament prophecy, uh, that the trees of the field will clap their hands. Any of you know this song? A few of you. And a lot of times, am I wrong in this? In, in Jewish rhythm, it's kind of on an off syncopated. So we're going to, I think we have to stand to do, do this because you're going to need to clap on this song, okay? So if you could kind of give us that rhythm of this song, Sandy, and uh, I'll try to start you on the clapping, but it will, I'm not guaranteeing how this is going to turn out, but we're going to try it. shall go out with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy and all the